Well, hi everyone, welcome back to Photoshop Master Effects Training. I am Corey Barker, and in this little project course, we are going to be taking a look at another sports ad design. And it's going to be looking like a lot like this. Now, there's a lot of really cool things happening in this particular design, um, especially with textures in the background and things like that. And the important thing is to take these techniques and use them in a variety of different ways. In fact, a lot of what you're seeing in this design are using techniques that have been used in other projects here on this site. And this uh, gives you an idea of the, um, how versatile some of these techniques can be. Um, just by putting them in a different context, slightly changing things, you can get something new altogether. And that's really the whole point is once you learn a technique, find a way to get it into your workflow as part of your, your style and your design and everything like that. So that's what we're going to be going in this, uh, in this particular project. So let's begin by creating a brand new document to get started in. So I'm going to go ahead and go to File, New, and we're just going to make this document a square format, of course, but 2,000 by 2,000 pixels at 800 pixels per inch. We're we'll going to click OK. Now, I do not need the background white. I actually want it to be a black background, so I'm simply going to press Command or Control I to uh, invert the background and make it uh, black. Now, we're going to build the background first, and then we're going to bring our characters in or our, our subject, and then we're going to add the uh, other elements in the 3D a little bit later. So like I said, we're going to start with the background. So I have many elements that we're going to use to build a background. In fact, I've got um, a few stock images here, uh, of course. I've got this HUD graphic element, this heads-up display graphic. Um, I got it on Adobe Stock. It's a really cool, it's got a lot of really cool things happening here. Um, again, as I've talked about with textures, I'm not paying attention to the color. The fact that it's yellow or predominantly yellow here is of no concern um, because we're going to be changing that later on. I'm really just paying attention to the graphic itself, so it looks really cool. And then I've got a broken glass e uh, texture element here that we're going to use, and then of course I've got the subject that we're going to be extracting and bringing into the, the design as well. Like I said, we're going to start by building the background element, so I'm going to go ahead and open up the HUD graphic. Again, I found this on Adobe Stock. And I am going to go ahead and just rotate this. <clears throat> Actually, no, I'm not going to rotate it. I'm just going to go ahead and drag it over as it is. Let's go ahead and hold the Shift key down. Remember, I talk about adding the Shift key as I drag and drop, and it lands it, makes it land in the center just like that. Now, I'm going to scale it out because I want it to fit the overall canvas here, especially on the top and bottom. So I'm just going to press Command-T and then Command-0, and it's going to expand my document. So I can see the control handles. Now I'm just going to hold down Shift Option, and that allows me to scale it proportionately from the center. I'm just going to scale it out until it uh, covers the entire canvas area, just like that. Okay. Now uh, I want to remove the color. Again, I'm only interested in this as a design element, not for its color, but rather for its graphic element. So I'm going to go ahead and press Shift Command U or Shift Control U, and that goes ahead and makes it basically a black and white. Graphic. Now I'm also going to drop the opacity of this layer to about 50%, so it's a little bit more understated in that background there. Now we're going to put a layer mask on it and hide and do some fading on it in just a little bit, but let's add some more elements to this um, to get the background a little bit more in place. So I'm going to create a new blank layer right above that HUD graphic element, and I'm going to go and get the gradient tool here in the toolbar, and let's go and get the foreground, the transparent gradient, which I always pretty much use all the time. And we want to use a radial gradient, which is the second one right here. Uh, normal, 100%, everything looks good. Now let's get a blue color in the swatch panel. So just get a sort of bright blue color here. And I'm just going to draw the gradient out from the center, and it just gives me that glow like that. Now I'm not going to use any blend modes or anything like this. This is going to be a simple gradient as it is. and we're just going to leave it normal at 100% for now. Now, let's add the glass element. Let me go and grab that, and we'll open that up. Showed you this a moment ago, and you can see this is that grass, uh, glass element I was uh, showing you. Um, like before, like the other graphic, I'm just going to go ahead and drag and drop this over. And, of course, I need to scale it to fit in here. Now, I'm not concerned with it being right up against the edge of the document in this case because we are going to blend it into this image. I'm going to change the blend mode of this layer from normal to screen, and that's going to hide all the dark areas of that layer 
and only showing the glass elements there. Now, another thing you can do here is put a color cast on it. So if I press, uh, press Command or Control U, you can uh, bring up the hue saturation and check on Colorize here. And if you want to enhance the blue of that graphic, by adding a color cast to it. So even if you wanted to get a, contra a contrasting color cast or something like that. In fact, I think I'm going to put... See how a gold one looks? This is why you would want to probably do this as an adjustment layer. But I'm just going to do a little bit of a blue cast there, and that's going to be... So you can see the difference there. So we've got a lot of cool elements happening here. Now that I've got that glass element in place, I'm going to go ahead and go back to the HUD graphic layer. In fact, I'm going to bring my layers panel out so you can see what's going on here. I'm going to put a layer mask on that HUD graphic layer. Just add it, a reveal all layer mask so it's filled with white. And we're going to use that same gradient we were using earlier, uh, except now on the layer mask, it's going to be um, using black. And I'm just going to give this a little a fade in just a few random areas here, just to kind of push, you know, air elements of it in the back and everything like that, just so it doesn't look so evenly through here. And it gives a sense that this broken glass, glass explosion effect is kind of creating some visual distortion and obstruction and everything like that. So that looks really good. Now, one more thing we're going to add to this background. I'm going to go ahead and add another blank layer. And we're going to grab the brush tool. Now I'm going to go ahead and get this Particle Effect 2 brush. Uh, this is actually, you can actually get this as part of the download. It's a particle brush. But it is, in fact, a particle brush that I use in a couple of other projects here on this site. Like I mentioned earlier, um, once you create brushes and styles and other things like that, you'll find yourself using them over and over again just because they can give you consistently cool effects. But they're so universal in that you can modify them in so many different ways, you virtually get a new effect altogether. On this blank layer, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get that blue color again. And I'm just going to kind of dab around the outer edge here. Now, you might need to modify brush a little bit. I'm going to increase the spacing just a little bit here. And this is a great thing about tool presets here like this, is that once you load them, you've got the, the, the tool pretty much set. But you can also go in here and modify the behavior just a little bit. And I think, okay, that looks pretty good. So I'm, again, not going real crazy with... The effect, I just want to have this kind of subtle blue particle element kind of on the outer edge of this design. And that looks like it might look pretty good. Just adds a little bit more chaos and uh, drama to it. And if it seems like a bit much, don't forget, you can just drop down the layer opacity and that will lessen the effect considerably. In fact, I'm going to drop this to about 75%. And that looks really good. All right, so now we've got our background element in place. I think I'm going to go back to that broken glass layer and eh, let's maybe drop that to about 90. Just kind of lessen that effect. There is our background element set. Now we're ready to bring in the subject and the, and the foreground elements and the, and the text like that. But just to give you an idea, at this point, we've got a really cool abstract background. We could practically use this for anything. Um, we could take elements out or add more elements to it. But beyond the scope of this particular project, this is something you could take and use as a background on something else, be it a, a commercial ad or something like that. So again, one of the takeaways of this um, course is, is being able to build a background element with several different textures and being able to use it in a variety of different ways. So. Let's go on to the next phase and start putting together the rest of this design with our main subject. So let's go ahead and get the main subject image that we want to use. That's the one I showed you earlier, and it's this basketball player here. Now, because he's on a very simple white background, it's going to make it easier to select by... And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and use the magic wand tool and go up here to the options bar and drop the tolerance to around 10 and then just click the background once and for the most part it should get your entire now obviously it's selecting the background but you'll be able to see how accurate it is just by looking at the edge of the subject and i can see apart from this area right down here around his foot looks like it pretty much got everything in there <clears throat> so again remember drop that tolerance setting so it uh, narrows the scope of the magic wand tool and then just click on that background once. 
and you should be uh, good to go. Now, I am going to go ahead and select the menu now and go to inverse. So now it flips the selection around to the main subject. And we're going to zoom in on that one little section here where it got a little bit more than I wanted it to. And I'm just going to do add that back in manually. Just use the lasso tool here. And then just hold down the shift key and then just draw along that edge. Oops. Draw along that edge there and include that area in the selection. And that looks pretty good. So now I'm going to go and click on the refine edge button here in the options bar. And I should be able to see what uh, any obvious areas that might have gotten missed. And it doesn't look like anything really did get missed except a little area under the arm here. We're getting a little transparency there. So, yep, it did in fact include that little bit of area in there. And that is uh, that demonstrates yet another function of the refine edge is that when you are ready to start refining the selection, you can use that to make sure that you've got the overall selection of the subject. Just by clicking refine edge, you immediately see. And you can change your view. If I wanted to view it on a black background or as a color overlay or a black and white, and here you can see the edge detail is really quite good using that magic wand tool. Now obviously some areas in the hand here that, that got included in there. Now you can either go back and adjust that or adjust it after the fact if you wanted to. Uh, I think in this case I'm just going to leave it. It's not really an all too critical aspect of it. But it lets, well you know what, it's going to bug me. I'm going to cancel out of here. It's going to bug me if I don't. So let's go back in there. So I just canceled out of Refine Edge there. And let's go back in here and just add those little areas back into the hand here. Because they're obviously very bright, specular highlights here on his fingers and the wrist area there. So we're just bringing those areas back in. Even at the low setting, low tolerance setting for the Magic Wand tool, still it blended too much and it and included that area in there. So there we go. Okay, so yet again, refine edge. Now, because there's no soft edges or you know long hair on the subject or anything like that, I'm not going to necessarily use the refine radius tool. However, I am going to give the edge detection, uh, the radius slider here, just a little bit of a nudge, and that's going to help clean up or soften up any of the really minute edges that we really can't see up close there. And... Uh, I think everything else looks pretty good. I don't really need to adjust the contrast because we didn't really adjust in any really soft areas. So let's go back down here. Now I'm going to go ahead and bring this back as a new layer. I do not need a layer mask. I just, I just want to pull the subject out from the white background and I do not need to uh, be able to adjust the mask later. So a new layer will be fine. So we'll click OK. And there it is nicely pulled out of the background there. So now I'm going to take this subject, the extracted subject, and just drag and drop it into the working design here. And let's put it at the top of the layer stack here. And this is obviously very large. So let's go ahead and scale it down. And again, using the same shift option scale proportionally to the center method here. And put my subject right there. Okay. Now, I want this subject to really kind of almost kind of feel like he's in this scene here. Now, obviously, this is a very abstract background, and we're just building him on a design, but I, I want to have that kind of blue um, glow that's in the background kind of spill over onto my subject here. So I'm going to create a new layer above the basketball player, and I'm going to get my brush tool, and I want to go and get a very simple, round, soft edge brush here. And let's give it some very basic behavior here. Uh, I'm going to go into the shape dynamics. I do not want to use pen pressure on the size. Um, however, I may, uh, I was going to use pen pressure in in the uh, opacity, but I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to use it straight as it is. So, so let's just use the soft brush as it is. And on that blank layer, which I'm going to set the blend mode of that layer to overlay. And let's zoom in just a little bit here. Now, I'm going to go ahead and sample the brightest blue color in the uh, existing background here. And let's make the brush a little bit smaller. And I'm just going to paint around my subject. And let's actually make that a little bit of a brighter blue. There we go. And I'm just going to kind of paint around the edge of my subject. And it's going to bleed over into the background, but that's fine. 
what I'm concentrating on is just the blue on the subject himself. So notice as we're painting over those kind of grayer areas, it gives the illusion of picking up the blue light of the background. So I'll just kind of paint over these areas here. And yes, I'm painting at full strength. I did not use pressure sensitivity. Ordinarily, I probably would, but chances are a lot of you uh, may or may not have a tablet. So we'll go ahead and do it without just to see how that's going to look. There we go. And again, I'm just painting around the edge here. I want it to kind of have this effect of light spilling over from the background. And let's get around the head here. I don't want to paint over the entire subject, but rather just mostly around the edge there. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to drop the layer opacity now to, uh, let's go ahead and drop that to about 75%. And you can see what's going on there. Now, for the blue area that's spilling over onto the background, um, several different ways you can deal with that. You can put a layer mask on it based on the selection of the subject here, or you can just simply use a clipping group, which I'm going to go ahead and just do now. Um, if that top layer is selected, I'm going to press Option-Command-G, and that will create a clipping group, essentially making the layer above only visible through the layer below. So now you can see that spillover of pixels is gone away because it's masked away by the edge of the subject there. So if I pr press Option Command G again and disable it, you can see the difference there. So by adding that layer, we get this kind of blue edge glow on our subject and it just helps him blend in the scene a little bit better. So notice the difference here. He's really standing out there and, that, and looks a little bit more blended there. So just another little light trick using layers and blend modes. And I think I'm going to drop the layer opacity down just a little bit. And this is another thing that goes back to what I'm talking about. When, you, when you're when you building a design, try and keep as many things on their own layers as possible. You'll notice everything we've done so far is on its own layer. And we can go back and modify them or change them all together. If we decide I don't like any of the you know, particle elements and stuff like that, I can go and modify them as they are or simply delete the layer and start all over again. I don't have to start again on the overall design, just on that particular effect. So as much as possible, try and keep your elements on their own layers. And really are, are, isn't much limit on the amount of layers you can have. You can pretty much have thousands of layers if you want, if you really want to go that way, rat route. That's a lot of layer management, but, um, but you can certainly go that far if you wanted to. All right, so we've got the subject and everything's uh, looking good there. Now what I want to do is create those ring flares. Now, if, you've, if you're as a member of this uh, of the Master Effects training site, you probably know about the ring flare technique I did in the movie poster project. If you haven't uh, yet, after watching this one, if you're a member, go and check it out. It's a really uh, cool and fun effect and really great use of 3D in a way you probably wouldn't have thought of. So I'm going to create a new layer at the very top of the layer stack here, and we're going to get a flare brush. Now, this is a flare brush that is also available as part of your exercise download. And let's go ahead and get this down here. And it's this flare right here. There it is. Yeah, that one. So like I said, this will be available as part of your course download. So I'm going to take that flare and just set the foreground color to white. And I'm just going to give a few dabs along the bottom here. Don't get real excited. Just do, you know, two or two or three dabs right along the bottom. And then you're going to go to the filter menu and go to distort and choose polar coordinates and set it to rectangular to polar and click OK. And then you're going to get this cool ring flare effect made from that simple flare brush. So I'm going to scale it a little bit here. And then we're going to put this in 3D space. We're not going to make a 3D object out of it, but rather we're going to just put this flat flare in three-dimensional space by going into the 3D menu, go to New Mesh from Layer, and choose Postcard. And this puts it, as I said, in that 3D space, but it's still a flat two-dimensional layer. As you can see, when I rotate it around, it has that effect going on there. Now, what I want this to be is a glowing, just kind of a glowing ring around um, my subject here. Now, we're going to combine 
layer styles and 3D. Now the great thing about 3D in Photoshop is of course a 3D layer is still a Photoshop layer. So you can put a layer style on this layer and achieve um, a rather interesting effect by combining the two. Now I'm gonna jump inside of here and so you can see if I double click on there, it brings you the original flare image, you know, if you wanted to modify it or anything like that. I do not need to in this case, I just wanted to show you that. But that is available under the texture diffuse layer right there, layer six. So I'm gonna add that layer style. So I'm just gonna double click on the layer itself and select outer glow. And I wanna give this more of a gold color glow here. So we'll go ahead and make that. Um, hard light and let's just boost the opacity a little bit and that looks pretty good. Now, I wanna modify a few things about this 3D object. Now, in the 3D panel, so I'm gonna bring up the 3D and properties panel here. With the object itself selected in the 3D panel, go over here to the properties panel and uncheck the catch and cast shadows elements here. So this um, object will not cast or receive any shadows from any other elements because we're, we're gonna have another object in here in a moment. We don't want it, we, these things are giving off light so they wouldn't necessarily catch light. So we wanna make sure we turn off those various elements here. And we can go and now the IBL you'll notice on a, on a postcard is default white. By turning that off, you'll see that it goes dark like that. So you want to make sure and just go ahead and leave that on since it's just a full bright white there. And that looks pretty good. So now, again, like I said, you can move this around. If I select uh, the current view and move the camera around, you can see the object and we can get really interesting perspectives on this ring here. You can even get more dramatic perspectives by altering the lens of the camera, basically, that you're looking through. So when you have current view selected in the 3D panel, you can go to the properties panel here and you'll notice there is the field of view setting right here and you can set it by millimeter lenses. So if you know photography, you know that smaller numbers are wider angle lenses. So I'm actually gonna take this and drop it to Let's do like 35. And that obviously sets the object further away because of the, we changed the lens basically. So I'm just gonna drag the camera basically closer again. And now you can see as I rotate it around, we have much more dramatic angle that we're playing with here. So position that right there. Now, like I said, I wanna have another instance of this 3D element in here. So instead of creating it over again or duplicating this 3D layer and merging them to, to, together, which you could do, um, you can all you have to do really is just go and make sure that object is selected in the 3D panel. Go to the pop-up menu here and just simply choose instance object. It's connected now. There's almost like in the in the 3D world, it's almost like creating a smart object of a of a master layer because it's a separate 3D element. In fact, if I grab it and rotate it around, you can see it's in that same environment as the other 3D flare ring there but I can position it independently. So I'm actually gonna create this almost kind of like an atom energy type of effect here. So I'm just gonna rotate that around and I'll rotate the current view so I can get a variety of different dramatic angles for this. So we'll just go with something like this right there. And that looks pretty good. So again, remember you can select them individually and position them or reposition the camera and change the angle of it all together. So that looks really good. So the two things that are happening here, we've got these 3D elements. In fact, let me turn the layer style off so you can see. So the 3D element is just those ring flares in 3D space with an, uh, a duplicate instance of it. And you can see how they're just kind of interacting with each other just by in a circular area there. And then we throw this layer style on that 3D layer on top of it and that gives us that really cool ring flare glow on the object there. So like I said, another way of looking at 3D and creating these rather interesting abstract 3D design elements really quickly and easily. Now, once you have the rings in place, if you want to change their position and write a different um, axis, just use a little widget here. You can rotate this around so you can see more of the foreground element. Just a lot of different options to play around with. And obviously we're gonna uh, modify this once we get the text in place. 
And that is what we're going to start on next is creating the text element. So for that, I'm going to actually do that in a new document so I'm not distracted by all the other things that are happening here. So go ahead and save this uh, current working design. Uh, I've saved it earlier with a, with a new name. So go ahead and do a save. And let's go ahead and minimize that. And I'm going to go ahead and reset my workspace here just to get the panels a little bit more organized. And I'm going to create a brand new document. Now I'm going to make this the same size as the working document where we're already uh, building the design in. So 2000 by 2000 at 100. And the way that keeps popping up. And now we're going to use this to build our 3D text. So I'm going to go and grab my text tool and to set a text layer. And let's go ahead and type the words dunk fever. Now, of course, you can use whatever text you like. Um, if you want to do what I'm doing here just to be following along, that's fine. But feel free to try, um, especially after you've got the technique, try different uh, different words and uh, configurations and such, uh, such like that. So I want to format the text a little bit here. So I'm going to highlight the top layer and just give it a little bit of an adjustment on the tracking so the letter spacing is a little closer together there. In most cases, I try to avoid the letters touching each other when I know I'm going to be making them into 3D, and that's because they will fuse together once they're converted to 3D. And so it's sometimes it can be a little challenging um, adjusting those. With text, not so much, but I am going to go ahead and adjust the E and the V here so they are fused together. Just a little bit there. And then I'll just bring the other ones closer together, but not necessarily touching. And I think that looks fine. I'm going to give this one just a little nudge this way so it has a little bit more dramatic offset there. And I'm going to add an exclamation point as well on the text. Now what I want to do is give it a more dramatic angle. I want to skew it a little bit. So press Command or Control T and then just right click or control click right on the object and choose skew from the menu there. And you're gonna hold down the option key on Mac, Alt on Windows, and grab either one of the middle control handles on either side of the box here, and then just give it a little bit of a skew like this. So obviously if you're gonna grab this side, then drag down, but if you're gonna grab the right side, then drag up, and you get this dramatic angle for the text like that. I think also just for the sake of design, I'm going to make that exclamation point just a little bit bigger and adjust the spacing there. Now, when you place the cursor between two characters, you just simply hold down Option, left or right arrow will increase or decrease the amount of space between them. Okay. All right. So there's the base text for our 3D element. Now, I want to create the 3D text, but I also want to have it um, kind of framed by a larger version of the text just because so there's multiple layers here and for that we're actually going to make a duplicate of the existing text layer and what I want to do is actually add um, a stroke to this text now if I add a stroke using a layer style it's not going to convert it to 3D it's actually going to remember the original shape of the text it will not recognize the outer stroke layer style as part of the graphic so I'm going to have to convert this to a shape layer so just right click on the layer and choose convert to shape. And this will go ahead and turn it into a simple shape layer. Now if I go and select the text now, it's vector shapes. And you can go up here in the options bar and see where the stroke setting is. I'm going to set that to black and then let's put this and set it to around 10. Now we don't see any obvious change and that's because we've got to go in here into the options and then go down here to the align and choose align it on the outside. And we also want to set the caps and corners to uh, rounded corners uh, so it gets a nice smooth um, edge there. And the size is obviously a little small, so let's bring that to maybe 30. And that looks like it might work pretty well. Might actually go a little bit thicker, and let's go 35. And that looks good. Now, we've obviously got a few little elements here that are showing through. Now, when we convert to 3D, it's going to actually knock those little tiny areas out. They're so small, let's go ahead and just include that in the overall shape. So I'm going to select the object. I'm going to grab a shape tool here. It's just a simple um, the ellipse shape tool, rather. And go up here and choose Combine Shapes. And we're just going to draw over the element here. And that's going to add 
to the shape and basically knock out those areas there. So there we go. So now I'm gonna bring the other text element and just for the sake of visibility, I'm gonna make fill it with white. So you can see what we've got going on here. So we've got a layer that is the text itself, that's white right there. And then behind it, we've got this um, over, oversized stroke layer and that's gonna be the outer frame of our 3D text element there. All right. So now let's go ahead and start making it into 3D. Now I'm gonna start with the regular text, which is the white text, and actually going to change the color. I actually want this to be text, white text in the 3D, in the final 3D design, but you don't necessarily use pure white as your fill color. I'm actually gonna set this to a very light gray fill, like that. Then we're gonna go ahead and do 3D, so go to new three, uh, the 3D menu and get a new 3D ext extrusion from selected layer. And there you can see it extrudes the text and again we need to have our 3D and properties panels open for this. Go and select current view and just give it a little bit of a rotation. You'll see the extrusion is a lot deeper than we actually really need it to be. So if I select the main text 3D object in the 3D panel, you can see in the properties panel the extrusion depth is at 525 pixels. That's a lot. So go ahead and highlight that and drop that to like 50. And there you can see it gets a little bit more manageable there. So I'm gonna bring this back up and I'm going to hit uh, default camera and that's gonna bring me back to the front view here. And let's add a couple more different things to this text. We adjusted the depth of the extrusion. I'm gonna reselect that text object here in the 3D panel and we're going to jump over here up at the top of the properties panel. you got these uh, tabs at the top. We're going to jump over here and set, or actually click on the cap setting right here. And then we're going to go down here and we're going to add a little bit of a bevel to this. Right now the width is at, uh, zero. So go ahead and set this to five. And that gives me a little bit of a bevel edge on the text itself. And then just below that, you're going to see the inflate section right here. I'm gonna leave the angle at 45, but I'm gonna go down here to the strength setting and set this to two. And what that's gonna do is you see it slightly bulges out the front face of the text, increasing the surface area. But the cool thing is a curved area, even a slightly curved area, will reflect the environment a lot better than just a simple flat surface wheel. You obviously have to have things at a specific angle to see them reflected on a flat surface, but a curved surface can give you a little bit more variation there. So again, we're just adding a very, very subtle 2% on the strength there for the particular um, for that particular text. Now we got we're gonna adjust a few more things with this, but let's go back and add the other text element, which is that outer framing uh, text shape here. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and turn off the layer above here, and we're uh, right here on the shape layer. Now here's an interesting thing: if I go and choose, if I go to the 3D menu and go down here and choose New 3D Extrusion from Selected Path or even Layer it's gonna give me a warning. You can see it's gonna tell me that the path is too complex. Don't freak out when that happens. If it does, you can simply just go over here and rasterize the layer entirely and basically turning it into a pixel filled shape. Now, if you go to the 3D menu and go to 3D extrusion from selected layer, it will go ahead and do it. It basically simplifies it as a pixel based shape. So, but it's still able to give you the 3D object. And since this is basically a framing element for the text, it's fine um, for that particular purpose. But when you do that, you'll notice on the edges, some of the edges, you see the little bit of the background peering through here. A, quite, a very simple fix for that is, if you're in the layers panel, under the diffuse textures here, just double click on the main texture, which brings you back to that main image fill. Just go ahead and fill the entire layer with black instead of just the shape. Because once you define the 3D shape, it's, it's going to go ahead and retain that. But changing the fill in here, and it will go ahead and fill in the gaps of those elements on that layer there. Now I'm going to go ahead and just rotate this uh, the camera view a little bit more. And this one, like the other shape, we need to adjust the depth of the extrusion. So again, I'm going to select the object here in the 3D panel. And in the properties panel, we're going to select the element. And let's this one, let's make it 100 on the depth. The last one we did 50 and we'll go ahead and do 100 for this one. And I'm going to go ahead and hit default camera and bring it back to the front view again. 
Now I'm also going to go in and add a little bit of a bevel on this text. Let's do a smile. I did. I started with a five like the other one, but let's make it smaller. Let's go with a two pixel blur on this one, or two percent blur. I'm sorry. I keep saying blur. Two percent width on the bevel uh, for this particular shape here. Now I'm also going to go in and set or increase the strength on this one the same amount as the last one, which is just two percent. That just slightly bulges out the face so we can get a better reflected um, surface error, and you'll see that come to play in just a little bit. All right, so now all the elements are pretty much in place for this. Now I'm going to turn back on this original layer, the, the, the other text layer, and now we have two 3D objects, or two 3D text layers, that we need to merge into a single 3D layer. So with the top layer selected, I'm simply going to press Command or Control E, which is the normal shortcut for merging two layers together. But in this case, it recognizes that they are, in fact, two 3D layers and remembers to keep them separate as far as 3D elements. So now you can see the white text pretty much disappeared, and that's not a problem. Don't freak out. I'm going to select that object here in the 3D panel, and you can see it's actually just hidden right inside the other text there. So if you just grab the slide tool and click and drag down, now add the shift key so it doesn't move around and just pull it forward. So clicking and dragging down pulls it just a little bit forward there. And if I grab my current view and rotate it, there you can see now we've got this rather interesting looking 3D text element and a lot of really interesting things happening here. Now that once it's there in place, I can see that I can maybe adjust a few of the overall properties here. Like first of all, the thickness of the outer shape I can drop that down to maybe like 75 rather than 100. And the main text element, you can use the widget, of course, too. If I highlight on the blue arrow here, and it'll, if I move it back and forth, it'll keep it on that axis, and I can determine exactly how much I want it sticking out of the front of that element there. Let's go ahead and set. Go back to the default camera. And we're looking really good so far. Now, I'm going to go ahead and take this over to the working design and do add the finishing textures and lighting and everything to that. But before we do that, let's get rid of that ground plane shadow that we see there. We do not need that. So I'm going to go and select the environment property in the 3D panel, and let's just go down here to the ground plane section. And you'll see that there is the shadow opacity at 60% default. So just go ahead and set that to zero and then press enter. Now, when you do this, and this is... I think just a little bug in Photoshop. When you set it to zero, you'll see this kind of moiré pattern appear over your object. Or maybe you don't. I don't know. It may be just my machine. But if you see that, you can um, either live with it, because it will go away when you render the object. Um, but visually, it's just not very appealing. If it's annoying you that much, and it does me, you can actually just set this to one, and it will go away. But here's the curious thing. When I set the opacity to one and press Enter, watch what happens. It goes to zero. So, curiously, it 1 is 0 in this case, but the good thing is the moiré pattern has gone away. So, for whatever reason, it does that. I don't know, but that is the workaround for now. So, let's go and uh, let's bring back up our original design here and let's go ahead and grab the 3D text here. Now, when you drag and drop 3D objects from one document to another, I find that it's easier to grab the layer itself. Instead of dragging, like, you know, normally I'll just click on the image itself and just drag and drop it over. Um, I find it easier with 3D objects to just grab the layer and just drag and drop it. Again, hold the shift key down, and then that way it'll land in the center just like that. Okay. So now let's, uh, let's reset our workspace here. And once again, let's bring up the 3D panel and the properties panel. And let's start dressing up our text here. Now, the first thing is, uh, I'm going to take a look at the background shape element. Now, in the 3D panel, you can actually turn certain 3D objects on and off. So in this case, I'm going to turn the main text object off for the moment, and we're going to concentrate on the background shape. Now, I'm going to go to the front inflation material. You'll notice here in the 3D panel, I've got front inflation material for this object selected. We're going to go into the Diffuse file and just go down here and choose Edit Texture. And this is going to open up the original document um, that it was created from. Remember the one we filled with black earlier to take care of those other shapes. I am going to get this yellow color here. 
and you can see here in my color picker what this um, color yellow is made of. And I'm going to take that and just press Option Delete and fill this entire document with that color. And when I close it and save the changes, you're going to see it um, cover that entire area there. Now this also affected the bevel of my object. So we're going to go into the bevel material and do the same thing. But this time we're going to create a brand new document altogether. In fact, I'm going to make it very much smaller. And that I'm going to give a really dark. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to give it a black fill or almost black fill. A really, really dark gray fill. Let's go with that. Close that. Save the changes. So there you can see that is much better. I'm going to rotate my view here a little bit. Now the extrusion color, I also want to make that uh, black as well. So I'm going to go ahead and edit texture. When three, uh, Photoshop creates an extruded object, the extrusion is a default gray um, as it appears in the image, but when you open up the texture file, it's actually transparent. There's nothing there, so you've got to put a color in there. So I'm just going to go ahead and fill that with that uh, same dark, dark gray that I've got. Close that and save the changes. There we go. All right. So again, let's bring back to the default front view here, and that looks pretty good. Now, now that we've got the colors in place, I'm going to go back to that front inflation material and we're going to add some reflection properties. So we're going to take the shine and the reflection up a little bit. Now, immediately I'm going to see this these highlighted uh, specular elements show up. Those are the default image-based light here. So if I go in my environment property and you'll see the IBL with the, the dots here, and you'll see this orb show up in the middle of your uh, image, you can actually click and move around and you can see the reflection, how it interacts with the uh, the surface there. And you'll see that because of that curved surface, we're getting this rather interesting uh, distribution of that specular highlight on the text there. But we're not going to use this uh, M uh, this IBL. We're actually going to change that in just a little bit. But I just wanted to show you that once you start applying the shine and reflection, you're going to see those properties show up, uh, or, the, or see those reflections show up. Now I am going to brighten up the specular uh, brightness here just a little bit. So again, that's just going into the specular swatch here and just making it a slightly lighter gray color. It makes those specular highlights much, much brighter. Okay. So again, like I said, we'll get to the, the IBL modifying that in just a moment. So let's go back and bring the other text up here that we have. And this one, like the other one, we're going to do some of the same things here. Let's go to the extrusion material on this one. And we're going to create a new texture here. Yet again, and this uh, also going to fill with that same dark color. That is the extruded side right here. The bevel on the text element, I'm going to create a new texture as well. And that I'm going to give a slightly lighter gray color, not as light as the foreground or the front plan inflation, but rather just a little bit lighter gray, something like that. So again, that is the bevel color that we just adjusted there. Set the default camera. And the front inflation, or the front face of that text is that light gray color. Um, you'll notice it's applied now as a standard color or just using the swatch panel here. It's not, a, it's not applied as a texture file. So you can, uh, you can do that either way. I'm going to leave it alone as is for now, but I am going to increase the amount of shine and reflection on all three of these surfaces, both are the uh, front inflation, the front bevel, and I'm just setting the shine and reflection right about in the middle. Actually, for the bevel, I'm going to make it even a lot. I want it to really kind of have a nice shine. You can see that right away. See the little specular shine on that bevel right there? So and that's by increasing that amount there. So we're given the extrusion and the front inflation about midway shine and reflection, but the bevel, you really want to amp that up so it gets a nice, um, picks up a nice specular hot spot on the edges there. And you know, I'm gonna do the same thing for the outer shape too. Let's go ahead and set that shine and reflection on the bevel at a very high number. So it gives me a nice amount of play on there, okay. So now if I move this around, you can see I've got interesting things going on. If I move, I'm moving the camera around in the object so I can see that the text is uh, looking rather interesting. I've got those bevels, 
picking up pretty good. Not seeing anything on the extrusion here, and that's because we have not applied the shine and reflection. And see, now there it is. Okay, let's brighten that up just a little bit. And now as I move this around, we can see those elements are shining on the edges there. Now again, we are going to change the IBL. In fact, let's go ahead and do that now. So we've got all these elements in place and the, the light's interacting pretty well. And everything looks really good. So I'm actually going to go to that environment property and we're gonna, I'm just gonna go ahead and edit the existing texture now. Um, let's increase the size. I'm just gonna make it double the, double the width. So 1024 and go ahead and make that O. And I'm just gonna fill the image with black. And we're just going to make an abstract selection with my lasso tool here. I'm just going to kind of draw a shape here along the edge. And then just add a simple gradient. Just like that. That's pretty much all I'm going to do. In the sense of IBLs, especially when you're applying them to a design object like this, in this case text, using an abstract shape like this will give you a rather interesting result. Now, if you wanted it to look like it was glass or something like that, reflecting an environment around it, then you would certainly want to use a photograph or something like that. But in this case, I think you'll see that this uh, result looks really good. So I'm going to close this and save the changes. And you may, not, may or may not see an immediate change right now, and that's because you've really got to move the IBL around to get the best angle. So while the environment property is selected and you see that little round orb in the middle, click on the um, outside the text area and just click and drag around and you'll see that light element interact on the surface. So there you can see right along the air how that edge looks. Now I'm going to select that text element and again increase the amount of specular highlight there. And that gives me that kind of cool, you know, shiny plasticky look about it. And that looks really good. Now I'm going to go over here into the current view and this is something I always talk about is getting really dramatic angles by changing the lens at which you're looking at the the object. You know, earlier we changed the lens um, on the flare rings here and it gave us a much more dramatic angle. We're going to do the same thing with the text and we're going to go even more extreme with it. I'm actually going to set this to about 15 and you can see it drops it back in space because of the lens change. Now let's bring it closer. And now you can see how much a more dramatic angle we're getting simply by changing the lens of the camera. Now, a virtual camera, for to be sure, but if you come from a photography background, then you can see how you can take that knowledge of lenses and apply it here in the, in the design sense to get some really dramatic angles like this. Now, Everything looks really good. And now we'll just uh, take a look at the lighting here. Now, when you create a 3D object, it creates an infinite light by default. And then you, of course, have that default IBL or image-based light that we had a moment ago. But we changed that. Now we need to change the lights themselves. Now, ordinarily, by default, it, acts, it adds an infinite light, which is a light that shines in one, one direction in a kind of a universal way. And as you can see, I move this orb around. You can see the light changing direction there. Unfortunately, the infinite light is my least favorite 3D light here in Photoshop, and it actually is the default. But we are going to change this. I'm actually going to go in, um, while the infinite light is selected, we're going to go into the properties panel here, and in the type menu, change this to a point light. And if it goes away, just actually click move to view here, and it'll bring that little element right there in place. So I'm actually going to move this up. And so use the 3D tools to move the light. Now if I move the light closer to the object, you'll see how the lighting tends to have a little bit more dramatic look to it versus what the uh, the infinite light was giving us. That, um, uh, that light also, I'm going to drop its intensity to about 75 and that looks pretty good. So now I'm going to add a second light here and I'm going to do that. Uh, I'm just going to go into the little menu here and choose new point light. And this time we're going to give it a different color. I'm going to click on the little swatch here next to the word color, and we're going to give it a bright blue 
color here. And I'm going to bring the intensity up quite a bit. Let's go somewhere around a little over 200. But I'm going to position this light closer to the object. Let's actually move to view. So let's move it closer to the object. So I'm using the slide tool, the 3D slide tool. You click and drag up, and it pushes it closer. As you can see, eventually it's going to go inside of it like that. But once I'm about there, I'm going to drag it down because I want the light coming from the bottom here. Let's drag it forward a little bit until we get a little bit of spillover. Let's bump up the intensity quite a bit here. So now you can see I'm getting that angle of that text just a little bit brighter. So that gives me another light source. And if I move my current view around, you can see how it's picking up that edge of that light there. So there we go. Not bad. Okay. Not bad at all. Okay, so now what I want to do is just a couple more things. We're just about done. The front face of that text, the Dunk Fever text here, I actually don't want that to look like the kind of plastic look. In fact, just if you wanted to at this point, just do a quick little start render. Just uh, Shift Option Command R, and that will go ahead and start rendering. And you can get an idea of how the finished renders of the text is going to look. So you can see how that bright blue light is kind of off to the side there. That may need a little bit of adjusting. Let's make it a little bit more blue. Perhaps even push it back a little bit. There we go. So like I was saying, that plastic face of the text, I don't want it to be just a flat, you know, plasticky look on it, at least on the white area. The the yellow area in the background with that kind of plasticky um, sheen to it, that's fine. However, I want to add a texture to the front face of the white text here. So to do that, we're going to cheat a little bit. And I hope nobody at Adobe really reprimands me for this. But I found this texture of this basketball texture over on Adobe Stock. Now it is watermarked, but fortunately it's not watermarked in the area we need because it is a texture. So, if you're at, if you work at Adobe, look away. But we're just actually going to use this to create a small patch of a seamless texture here. So the first thing is, let's take the rectangular marquee tool and just draw a box over a large area of this texture. I'm going to go ahead and just copy that and make it a new document. And there we go. So I'm going to remove the color, just press Shift Command U, and then we're going to do go to Filter and choose Offset. And that's Other Offset, because we can Filter Other Offset here. And just give it an offset until you can see where it tiles, where the tiling meets. And... Bring that down a little bit more. So you can see, it's pretty, it's not a wholly obvious, you know, that there's tiling there. You have to look really, really close, but we're just going to adjust it so it blends a little bit better. Now I'm going to use the patch tool for So just draw over those areas and then just kind of fill in the gaps there. Doesn't have to be 100% perfect. It just needs to look as seamless as much as it can. So that looks pretty good there. So I'm going to take this as it is. So go ahead and press Command A and then copy it. So this is essentially a rather seamless little tile of a basketball texture that we took from the comp of a stock image. Sometimes you got to cheat. It's okay. And we're going to go back to that text, that white text object, object there. And we're back on the front inflation material here in the 3D panel. When you have that selected, go to the properties panel. And you're going to go down here to the bump setting right down here. And go down here and choose new texture. Let's actually make sure it's the right texture of the object. Yeah, that's okay. All right. So, uh, again, at the, proper, uh, the bump property, we're on the front inflation material of the white text there. So go to the bump property, choose new texture. Click OK. It's going to go ahead and open it up. So go ahead and paste that image in there. And then press Command S to save. And you're going to see that, that bump texture show up on the object. Now it's obviously 
incredibly large on there. And don't freak out. We're going to be able to adjust that in just a moment. So I'm going to close that for, for now. And then we're going to go back to that texture. Uh, back to the bump property here, sorry. And we're going to drop the amount to five. So it's not nearly as much as it needs to, as it is. And then we're also going to go into that same menu again. And instead of choosing Edit Texture, we're going to choose Edit UV Properties. And here you can actually scale this texture down. In fact, I'm, I'm going to drop both of these numbers. And let's start in both at 50 and see what we get. So there we can see it's a little bit more like it should be. So I'm actually going to use... I, I like to use the scrubby sliders here to adjust the texture. You can see it looks on there. And you can use the scrubby sliders just by moving your cursor over the setting and then moving back and forth. Those are great for very minute adjustments, but if you want to make big adjustments, just use the big sliders over here. These make really big, quick adjustments there. So just a couple of ways to edit these. And I'm going to adjust that size down to there, and I think that looks pretty good. However, the pattern is backwards. I actually want... You can actually see it's got dimples, and the uh, the... the edges of the outer areas are actually kind of pushed forward and I need to I need it to be opposite of that so let's click OK go back into the main texture itself and just simply press command I to invert and then press save again and now the texture is looking like it should so now it's got that same kind of basketball texture feel about it but now it's um, going in the right direction and that's because of simply inverting that bump map there so I'm going to go back into the Edit UV Properties here and just adjust the scaling here a little bit more. It looks pretty good. So just another way of thinking about 3D text in the, in the sense that you can apply bump textures to enhance the theme of your overall design here. And I'm just going to grab my current view and rotate it around and just see what we've got here. So here's where you can get real... real have a lot of fun really just trying different angles and doing different renders to see what kind of uh, ultimately what kind of effects you get now one more thing I'm gonna to add to this 3d layer for as far as the 3d part of it we're pretty much done so it's just a matter of choosing an angle and once you get an angle of the text you like remember you can move that IBL around and get the best angle on it by moving it around independently as well this is something I, I've always loved about 3D is that you are you can essentially, you know, when you're a photographer, you have to light, and, light the scene and do it all during the shoot. And in the post edit, you really got to kind of live with the lighting scenario you've got. In this case, we're modifying the position of the lighting while we're designing it. And that just gives us an edge over how it's going to look in the end. So but what I wanted to do is add a layer style to this 3D layer. I want to add a little bit of an outer glow to this. So... Just double click on the layer and add outer glow here and let's make it a a rather light blue glow there we go something like that and we'll click ok looks really good so now everything is in place and it's just a matter of positioning things and then doing the final render on it so now that with the text there I can see that maybe I want to change the positioning and angle of my flare rings here maybe something like this and the flare ring layer again 3d layer but you can also add a layer mask on it, it again it's it's a it's a photoshop layer so you can do pretty much anything that you can do to a photoshop layer the cool thing is it's still a 3d graphic element there so i'm actually going to maneuver this just a little bit that way but uh, you can put a layer mask on it, and if certain areas you want to hide, then you can just simply just draw a gradient over there, and it will go ahead and hide whatever you want it to. Still keeping it 3D, and still able to edit the 3D, but you can um, pretty much treat it like a regular layer in there. So that is pretty much it. Now it's just a matter of going in and tweaking the various settings. So if I move this over, you can see how the lighting interacts on the object and and everything but as I said in the beginning it's a lot of different techniques that you can use in a variety of different ways and again as I mentioned we use several techniques uh, that are part of this site that are used in other projects on this site things like the flare rings and even the 3d text we've actually done uh, a couple different variations of this on a couple of other projects but here 
we're doing things a little bit differently by adding a bump map and doing a few other different things and even adding the um, the layer style glow to the 3D layer as well. So it's just another way of seeing how 3D design can be integrated into your overall design workflow and uh, being able to generate more interesting graphic elements here. And the cool thing is once you do in 3D, you can try different angles and ultimately end up with a different design altogether. So, and that's the fun part is that once you have the elements um, assembled, then you can just go over here and just try different angles and different things and see ultimately how it's going to work out. Now, you might ask, might be asking, well, what if I want to change the text? Well, you can. You can change the, the, the white text here, but remember the outer shape we rasterized in order to create the 3D. That you would have to recreate and then just merge with the text layer over again if you really wanted to create um, that element um, over again. But yeah, short answer is yes, you can go back and modify it, but you'll just have to go through uh, a few different things. But it's still a lot better than going back and starting over all together once again. So, hope you enjoy this week's project here on Photoshop Master Effects Training. We'll see you guys next time.